Good morning, everyone, on this wonderful morning. That, um, and welcome to our webinar on the UBD policy. Uh, I'm glad you are here. That uh, we give it one more minute because I'm. There will be some more people joining. I think. Uh, it always takes a bit of time. That uh, this morning I, I will do a, a presentation on the project, and then there is also some time. Uh, for question and answers. Um, if you have already some questions, put them in the chat so we can look at them uh, and we'll get back to them at the end uh, of the uh, presentation. I'm going to pull up my presentation. To get that ready, because... Okay, let's start with the presentation that, um, welcome everyone again. Um, so we'll be talking about the urban burden of disease uh, estimation for policy making project or the UBD policy uh, project. Some people have been complaining to me that the name is not so easy to remember, but I'm sure after this presentation, you remember the name very well and you will think about it over the next uh, four years. Um, this is an horizon project. Um, we started off in, in January. Uh, the project is for four years. Um, and I'll explain a little bit later uh, what it entails. The project has a, a bit of a history. It doesn't come out of nothing. Um, and we've been working on this already for a couple of years. Uh, and I would like to do uh, or to present you um, a few results from uh, our previous studies. Um, the main database that we're working with is uh, a database of a thousand uh, European cities uh, for which we have uh, quite a bit of data in terms of, of exposure data, boundaries, um, population data, mortality data. And we've been doing some analysis um, before that have already been published uh, based around the year 2015. This was the first year and also the last year for which we all had this uh, data available. So we could do some work with this. Uh, for this, uh, we used a health impact assessment uh, methodology, try to estimate what was the mortality burden related to a number of different exposures. And I'll show you some of the results, uh, what we've had so far. So first of all, we were looking at uh, air pollution. Uh, air pollution is, is a big problem, as you may know, uh, still within cities, including in the EU. And we estimated how many deaths could you prevent um, if you would meet uh, a certain level of exposure. And this uh, time uh, we looked at the WHO uh, air quality guidelines and we estimated that we could avoid uh, more than 160,000 deaths each year if we would meet the new WHO uh, guidelines for uh, air pollution. This is uh, for PM2.5, this is uh, 5 micrograms per meter cube and for NO2, um, 20, um, no, 10 micrograms per meter cube. Um, so when you look actually at the cities uh, that were most affected uh, by air pollution and at the highest mortality for, there were actually differences between uh, different cities for the different pollutants. I mean, if you look at uh, particular matter, PM2.5, um, the cities with the highest mortality burden were in, in Northern Italy, like Brescia and Bergamo. Um, partly because of the, the industry there and also the, uh, the conditions uh, there, I mean, the, the landscape, et cetera. And then also followed by cities in, in the Czech Republic uh, and also Poland where there's still quite a bit of coal burning. On the other side, when you look at NO2, uh, we found that cities like Madrid, Antwerp, uh, Turin um, had the highest mortality burden related to NO2. And this is uh, to a large extent related to traffic. I mean, um, traffic is still a major contributor uh, to NO2 uh, levels, and um, that was reflected in this particular ranking. 
We also looked at um, green space. Uh, we know that in many cities there is not enough green space, so uh, we tried to uh, estimate to see if we would increase green space, how many deaths we could uh, avoid each year. Now the WHO has a, a recommendation for green space to say that everyone should live within 300 meters of uh, a major green space of around one hectare. Uh, first of all, we found that 60% of people didn't have uh, access to green space according to this recommendation of the WHO. Uh, what is kind of a large uh, number? And we found that, you know, if we would increase green space in the thousand cities, uh, we could uh, prevent 43,000 uh, deaths per year. If you look at the ranking, uh, maybe a bit of a surprise uh, to you, uh, we see, for example, that the highest mortality uh, burden related to the lack of green spaces in, in Brussels, followed by Copenhagen and then Budapest. Um, and partly this is because, um, you know, the green space is not always where people are. So what we see is, for example, that uh, some cities are pretty green, but the green space is on the outskirts of the cities and not actually where people live. Also for a city like Copenhagen, it has quite a lot of blue space and that was not included in the analysis. And um, so blue space, we know it's also beneficial for health, but, you know, it doesn't uh, count in our analysis. So that's why it came up fairly highly as well, uh, because it's also um, in the city itself in Copenhagen, there's not as much green. If we look at noise, uh, it's a bit more complicated, partly because uh, the kind of available noise data that we have is not very comparable. Uh, but we estimated that um, more than 60 million people are exposed to noise levels in these cities that are harmful uh, to health. We also um, estimated that we could prevent 3,000 deaths annually uh, through to ischemic heart disease um, alone uh, for noise. If you look some at the cities that have some of the highest noise levels and highest uh, levels of, of harmful levels, uh, we see cities like uh, Madrid, Paris, uh, Rome, where you know a large majority of the population uh, suffers of, of a lot of noise, particularly traffic-related noise. And this is not uh, surprising, I think, because um, even when you go to the cities, there is quite a bit of uh, noise around, so you can experience this. Um, as part of the work, also, we made a website where people can go and check uh, for each of the thousand cities that were included in our analysis to see, uh, you know, what is the level of air pollution or the lack of green space or the level of noise in these cities and the related mortality. And also, we produced a ranking. Um, the website, uh, which you see at the bottom, isglobalranking.org, you can go in and, and check uh, specifically for your city uh, where you are. This is very useful for policymakers because, you know, before we started this project, there were not many cities that had estimates of mortality and uh, related to this particular exposures. And but for policy makers, it's important to to know what is the mortality burden or the health burden in general, so they can make policies to reduce this particular burden. That. Now we're based in Barcelona and for Barcelona, we um, did a health impact assessment looking at uh, the, the different exposures altogether. Um, and we estimated that there would be uh, that there are 3,000 premature deaths each year uh, due to suboptimal urban and transport planning practices. That's about 20% of the total mortality um, in the city. If you look where they come from, um, these are due to uh, some of the uh, exposures that I mentioned before, like the lack of green space with more than 100 deaths per year, um, uh, noise and air pollution around 600 deaths per year. But then also we see deaths related to uh, heat, extreme heat, what is occurring like in the city, but also to the lack of physical activity. Uh, but people always think about Barcelona as a nice city, but you know we also have a problem in terms of uh, high traffic density in the city, uh, and all these exposures are related um, to some extent to the to high traffic density here. 
So it's not surpri a surprise that our people are demonstrating and want to see changes in the city. Uh, and this is one of the things that we're also looking for in the new project, you know, to what kind of changes you, can you make in the city to reduce the burden uh, related to, to urban and transport uh, practices and also therefore reduce the uh, environmental burden and mortality burden in the city. Uh, in Barcelona, the, the idea was to implement uh, the superblock model. Um, the superblock is an innovative uh, urban model. Um, the idea is that uh, in, in a grid system, uh, the, uh, Barcelona has a grid system for traffic, which you see on the left side, traffic going up and down, left and right. Uh, you cut four junctions for motorized traffic and you only allow um, active transportation, walking and cycling, and also introduce more green space. So the whole thing together, what you can see here is a super block. The idea was to introduce 500 super blocks in Barcelona um, and then see, you know, um, to, to improve the conditions in, in terms of the environment, also physical activity and, and also for, for health. Unfortunately, we didn't get so far with five on the super blocks. Uh, we have so far kind of three super blocks. Uh, and this is one of them to give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, this is in Sant'Antoni. Uh, on the top, you can see what it was before. And at the bottom, you can see actually what it is afterwards, after the uh, changes that have been implemented. Uh, we did a health impact assessment and estimated that you uh, in the city, we could prevent almost 700 premature deaths uh, if we would implement all the 500 superblocks in the city. Um, most of the benefits come from the reduction in, in air pollution through NO2 uh, reductions, uh, followed by the reduction in noise, um, the heat, uh, extreme heat, what we saw, and also the introduction of more green. And then there's also some uh, benefits through the increase in physical activity, although this is underestimated probably because we didn't have any estimates um, on how the superblocks actually change physical activity. That, but as you can see, you know, by changing your urban uh, design um, by remodeling, you actually can prevent quite a bit of the uh, mortality burden. As I was saying that uh, only three superblocks uh, were implemented, and actually over the years they changed a little bit. Uh, the model and also what I called it. And now it's become the, the green corridors or Eches Badders. And uh, this, what you can see here is the, the center of Barcelona, the example area. Um, whereas for the super blocks, two out of every uh, three streets were uh, are being pacified. So uh, motorized traffic uh, taken away. In the uh, Echis Badders model, uh, one out of three streets is being pacified in a way to say it simply that. So here what you can see is that uh, the, the current grid or the grid system that was before and then overlaid with the green corridors, these green lines. Uh, like for the example area, the center here in Barcelona, 30 were planned uh, and so far four of them uh, have been implemented. Um, and one of the main ones is actually Concel de, Concel de Gen, what you can see right in the middle of the street, what's running through um, this, this particular area. If we look at uh, what they look like, it's uh, on the left top, uh, you can see uh, Rocker 4, I think it is, uh, what was before, where you can see, you know, a street with cars parked, uh, parked uh, driving around. And then on the other pictures, you can see afterwards where there is much more green space, people walking around, people sitting and then actually enjoying. And this is what we're actually seeing now. If you go to some of the street, this is the, the picture what we have, and it's a big improvement. So also for this, for uh, we try to estimate what would be the health benefits of these green corridors or as bad as on mental health if we would implement them throughout the whole city. So get many streets more uh, pacified and also more green. And uh, we estimated that we could uh, reduce um, mental health indicators, uh, things like uh, poor self-perceived uh, mental health or visits to um, psychiatrists or 
psychologists uh, and the use of, of antidepressants or tranquilizers, we could reduce them between 8 and, and 14%. Uh, what would be an annual saving of, uh, would give an annual saving of 45 million euros per year. If you look at an actual numbers, this would mean that we could prevent uh, 31,000 uh, cases of poor receive uh, mental health or, or around 10,000 uh, people that use tranquilizers uh, every year or 13,000 that use antidepressants. So these are fairly large numbers actually we could prevent if we would green the city more. Um, the numbers are large because in, in, in like in Barcelona and many other cities, many people suffer of, of poor mental health. Uh, and this only became worse, I think, after the COVID. Uh, and so, you know, these changes actually can uh, improve the situation. Finally, um, as part of our work um, together with the London School of Hygiene, we did some work around urban heat islands uh, because, you know, what we often see is that um, cities are car, car dominated, there's a lot of asphalt, there's a lot of concrete um, that absorbs the heat during the day and then releases during the night. Uh, uh, what results in often that the, the city centers are much warmer, three, four, five, six degrees warmer than surrounding areas. In this uh, particular study, we estimated that over 4% of summer mortality in uh, the 100 uh, cities that we studied uh, were attributable to urban heat island effects. But that if we increase tree cover up to 30% of the surface areas in the city, we could reduce the average temperatures by about 1.3 degrees Celsius and thereby uh, prevent about a third of the uh, mortality related to the urban heat island effects. At the moment, the tree cover in the cities is around 15%. So we were looking at doubling the tree cover in the cities um, to get this, uh, this benefits uh, by reducing the urban heat island effect. So this is a bit the background uh, of what the work we've been doing. And then we had the opportunity to apply for a, a Horizon uh, grant. Uh, there was a specific uh, proposal on health impact assessment. Uh, and um, then we got a few groups together um, to, to uh, write a proposal on this and, and to continue kind of the work or improve on the work that we've been um, doing. So here we've got uh, six partners in, in UBD policy. Um, the project is led by IS Global, where I'm working here in Barcelona and I'm the project coordinator. Uh, we also have the uh, University of Utrecht involved, um, Ulrike Gehring and Gerard Hoek as, as uh, main PIs there. Also the Swiss Tropical Health Institute um, with Kees de Hoog as the PI there. Um, the Linnea Unif University in Sweden, uh, uh, Stefan Gosling as the PI. Um, we also have um, the Health and Environment Alliance, a focusing group um, and policy group uh, from Belgium uh, with Anne Stauffer as, as the PI and together with Vladka. And then also in the UK, uh, the K University of Cambridge um, with uh, James Woodcock and Hanne Greis as the PIs there. Uh, we're working with this kind of uh, simplified uh, framework, uh, as what you, I showed you before, you know, the urban design, uh, our current urban models, I mean, they have an impact on health. Um, and so uh, the, the idea is to, you know, how you design your city, what your city is like, affects how people get around, how this leads to environmental exposures and lifestyle and, and physical activity factors, and then to morbidity and, and mortality. So, for example, I mean, that uh, we see that many uh, cities are car dominated. Uh, um, they're kind of the, given a lot of space to the car. Um, we get a lot of people going in the car uh, and that leads to air pollution, to noise, uh, heat island effects, uh, more stress. We know car drivers are more stressed, less social contacts, and in particular also less physical activity. And that uh, gives uh, more um, rise to diseases and also premature mortality. 
the idea is, you know, in the other side, if you could uh, change and get people more to active transportation, for example, if you get more people to cycle, uh, if you build in more cycling lanes, then you get more people to cycle, what is less air pollution, less noise, if people get more physical activity, so I have less disease and less premature mortality. Um, this, of course, is a very uh, simple framework. I mean, uh, in reality, this is also much more difficult, uh, more, much more complex, the feedback mechanisms, etc. But this gives you an idea. So the overall aim of the project is to uh, improve the estimation of health and well-being impacts and social economic costs and benefits, uh, in particular in cities, uh, focusing on uh, important environmental stresses. And these are some of the ones that I mentioned. Also, um, we want to um, come up with new uh, models, new scenarios, how cities could improve uh, the health in the city. And uh, to be able to do that, um, we're uh, developing uh, new policy frameworks that we can work with. We work in particular also with stakeholders to get their input. Uh, we're looking at new indicators, in particular new indicators for well-being, what is important. Also, uh, new tools uh, for cost-benefit analysis, because cost-benefit analysis is still very important for, for decision makers. Uh, as part of the work, we also produce uh, new estimates for environmental stresses in the in the cities, in this particular in this thousand cities, and um, also we look at the costing aspect of this. And you know, a very important aspect of this uh, project is also consultation with city stakeholders, um, and also produce guidelines for for good practices, and also strengthen the link between science and policy making. Uh, the work is divided into work packages, as they always are. I mean, as here, what you can see, where work package one is around the framework and also conducting some reviews on, on what is going on at the moment. Also, we're organizing workshops to bring in people, um, to get outside expertise, to bring in stakeholders, and to give, uh, to get, you know, a, a very good sense of what's going on that. Then also we're looking at the development uh, of new um, health and well-being indicators, in particular well-being. Also here we're looking at literature reviews, workshops to get input, and then the development of new indicators. Uh, work package three is around the cost-benefit analysis. Again, I mean literature reviews, workshops to bring in expertise, development of new indicators, and also new methodology, um, and also uh, new indicators to to include in the models. That then uh, work package four is around. Uh, uh, producing estimates of environmental stresses, uh, but also other things like in our case city studies for um, physical activity and accidents that uh, in work packets five, it's where the health impact assessment takes place where we look at the burden of uh, disease estimations, uh, in particular for mortality for the thousand cities. But we also have a number of case city studies where we're gonna do a more in-depth work and we also look at uh, morbidity. Uh, you've seen this before, these are our thousand cities that are well spread around. Uh, uh, Europe. Um, then, as what I said, we have a number of case city studies. I mean, at the moment, we have Barcelona, Brussels, Utrecht, uh, Warsaw, Manchester, Munich, Zagreb, and uh, Basel. But we're always open to include other cities as well. I mean, if you want to be part of this, uh, fortunately, it has to be without funding from our side. But uh, I think there's still a lot to be gained to join in that way. Then for the thousand cities, we're hoping to produce estimates for 2018, 2021, 2024 for uh, the environmental exposures uh, and also the mortality estimates to look at trends over time. That uh, We're very keen to work with others uh, in the cities uh, and other organizations, uh, bring in knowledge and also uh, make an impact because that's important. So here again, these are the case city studies, uh, what you uh, see here, um, you can see them on our website, there's a bit more information about them. That. As what I said, it's very important for us um, to work with other stakeholders, you know, um, we're coming from a public health uh, perspective, often we can't change things, so we're looking at others. 
um, that actually can make the changes. And you have to think about urban planners, transport planners, uh, but also, you know, the education sector, for example, you know, too many kids go to school by car. Uh, how can we change that? How can we get them out of the car, get them to walk, cycle to, to uh, the school? I mean, it would be much better for everyone. Um, also, we're looking uh, at more systemic uh, approaches to, to dealing with this um, and also for the solutions, building scenarios for the, for the future. That. So uh, what is new, I would say, for this project, what we're particularly looking at is to um, coming up with an updated framework, some models that we use, also exposure response functions, I mean, are being developed all the time now, doesn't mean that we're going to make new ones or develop new ones, do meta-analysis, but that we bring them together. Also, as what I said before, new health and well-being outcomes, um, new exposure estimates for the cities that will be also available to people to be used. Um, looking at exposure and uh, health impact trends over the years. And then in particular for the case city studies, looking at healthy planning scenarios. So how, what kind of models could we introduce in the future? I mean, think about a super block, think about a 50 minute city, think about the low traffic neighborhood, the car free neighborhood, the 30 minutes, uh, the 30 kilometer per hour city. You know, what can we introduce in the future to, uh, to improve health? Also, uh, the costing uh, cost benefit analysis, we would like to improve this, uh, bringing in more aspects, and particularly externalities of our current uh, work uh, is quite important. That, um, And as what I said, the, the increased stakeholder engagement, uh, it's very important that we get people on board uh, and also try to improve the science policy link because we want to make an impact, you know, we can improve our cities. I mean, our cities are great, but we need to improve them because um, the health burden is still uh, too high in our cities. Uh, we have a number of considerations here, um, particularly the gender uh, aspect is very important uh, for what is going on and also equity. You know, we know that uh, certain populations are still suffering more than others. So this needs to be taken into account. Uh, the budget for us is it's not great. I mean, it's it's good budget to work with, but it's limited. So we have limited resources in that way. We can only do so many things, but we're looking for leverage. And also we're very keen to work with other projects, uh, share the knowledge that we have, work on, on uh, you know, whatever is out there, be opp opp opportunistic and try to... Um, uh, do more than than actually what we have available here. So that's why we're very very keen on working with others as well. We had our first kickoff uh, with the particular partners uh, in May. Uh, it was a very uh, happy event. Uh, people were quite happy, I think. Um, getting going, um, moving on. But there is still, of course, uh, a lot of work to be done. This was the first meeting, in-person meeting we had. Uh, and, and now we're uh, taking this further. Um, we also now have a, a beautiful website. Um, I encourage you to visit our website, ubdpolicy.eu. Uh, you find uh, quite a bit of information there and there will be more information also um, coming along with the project. Um, hopefully uh, over the summer we get more more, more information coming in in the website. But I think, you know, uh, one of the things is that uh, it gives you an idea for what the project is about. Also, I would like to highlight that uh, the EU uh, funded five projects under this uh, particular uh, call, the health impact assessment call, and uh, they formed the cluster of the five projects, uh, and it's called a Meteor. Also, if you go to the website, you can actually find some information. So I hope that you've given us a uh, that you got a little bit an idea for what the project is about and uh, also to uh, show you that uh, changes are possible. I, I give you this slide. Um, if you come to Barcelona or if you have been to Barcelona, you may have visited. This is uh, the Park de Glorias. This is a new park. There used to be a big roundabout there before. And look at this. This is how 
it has changed and it's being used by many people. And I think that's what we need to be looking for in our cities to improve our cities, make them much more people friendly rather than car friendly. So we can also improve the health of our citizens. Uh, thanks so much. And I'm open to uh, questions if you have any questions uh, at the moment. If you have any questions, you can just open your microphone or you can put your questions in the chat. And don't be shy at eh, it. Uh... Hello, good morning. Good morning. I am Beatrice Busquita from Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I would like to say thank you for this uh, exciting presentation uh, uh, and the project need. Um, well, I would have so many questions, but one of that is about the exposition response function that you mentioned in the presentation. Could you explain a little bit more how do you develop or model these functions? Um, so the exposure response functions that we're using uh, are coming from the literature. Uh, so these are mostly based on, say, many epidemiological studies that have been carried out uh, uh, before, I mean, if you look at air pollution, there are many epidemiological studies that were carried out. Uh, then the WHO, the World Health Organization, did a review that produced meta-analysis. And for example, some of these exposure response functions they produced uh, that we're actually using, or kind of the Health Effects Institute, they produced a number of meta-analysis and exposure response functions, particularly for traffic-related pollutants. So that's what we're actually using. So depending you know, on which exposure, we look at the literature, if they're there, and uh, we make some assessment. Most of the time, we use a number of different uh, exposure response functions. We take one of the main ones and then do some sensitivity analysis to see if we would use a different one, uh, how much of a difference it makes to be sure, you know, to make sure that we are kind of comfortable uh, with the results, what we're getting uh, from the health impact assessment analysis. Okay, thank you. John Carson, question? Hi, good morning, Mark. Uh, Thanks very much. That sounds like a really fascinating project. Um, you mentioned that you're also going to be looking at the policy aspect of this work. Is that going to include looking into both public and political resistance or enthusiasm for these kinds of projects? Because uh, quite a few of them have been met with um, with quite a lot of public resistance when they've been implemented. Um, I'm curious if that's something you're going to investigate. Thanks. Yeah, so probably you're referring like to low traffic neighborhoods, what were introduced in, in, yeah. in London, uh, the 50 minute city that uh, got picked up by conspiracy uh, theorists. Uh, so yes, now, I don't know how far we're going into this. I mean, that, that's what we need to discuss also uh, as a project uh, with this. And actually next week we have a, a meeting in Cambridge, a workshop um, more to think about the overall project. And, and some of these things are coming in. I mean, initially we were thinking that we we're just uh, going to talk to stakeholders in the particular cities, you know, and see how they feel about this and even with people that resist against this. But uh, I can see that, you know, this, some of them take a, uh, are a bit bigger and they get picked up. So um, we have uh, HEAL, our organization um, is working on that. I don't know if Vladka is here on the call at the moment. I saw her before, but I can't see her. Um, and, and so we may do some analysis because, you know, it's one of these issues, um, what is coming up. Uh, I, I think one of the the thing is all, often from a public health view, we think that people always support this kind of changes because they're good for health. But then when you actually implement them, you find that there are 
uh, is quite a bit of resistance. We find the same here in, in Barcelona as well. So at some stage, we will do some analysis around the barriers, facilitators of making these changes, how far we can go, depends a little bit on the interest of people within the consortium or other people that want to contribute to this. I mean, as what I said uh, before, we're always looking for others um, to come in, for collaborators, people that think from, ah, this is a wonderful project. Uh, I would love to work with them as well and uh, come in there as well. Excellent, thank you. Vladka, do you want to say something as yeah, well? Yeah, I'm on the call, so I just- uh, Go ahead. Stop the video um you are completely right and we will explore barriers and like enablers as well but uh, in it, in some of our case study cities so um we will start with brussels we do not have capacity obviously to do the the analysis for all thousand cities and we will try to uh, gather this information that might be uh, useful for other cities although this is very kind of um, city level um, yeah barriers are something that uh, that is really related to what's the situation in the city and how do you communicate with citizens uh, uh, so yeah it will be probably quite quite a bit of um, uh, local knowledge uh, needed and um, I can announce that we are planning first workshop with the stakeholders in Brus in city Brussels in December this year and then later on we will have it in in Zagreb and in uh, Warsaw and yeah then other announcement will come later on thank you, thank you. Um, we've got a question in the chat from Imon that, um, and he's saying you mentioned that four green corridors were implemented in uh, in Barcelona, which is great. How long do you think it will take for the rest, um, and what specific barriers are there? Now, one of the things what's happening is that um, we just had local elections here in Barcelona in May. And the previous uh, local government, uh, what was uh, the, the Barcelona and Camus party led by Barcelona and Camus, they were very much in favor of these green corridors and they implemented quickly four before the elections. And then we got uh, the elections and in the, during the election campaign, there were quite a few of the other parties going against uh, the Echos Berdos, the, against the green corridors. They were campaigning against it. And uh, so what happened, we got a new mayor now, uh, this is the Socialist Party, and we don't know exactly what their plans are. They were campaigning, uh, campaigning against them, but you know, after the elections, things always change. So we're waiting to see if they actually um, abolish this particular plan to do the, the go up to the 30 or that they actually may implement them. So we're just waiting to see uh, what it is. Uh, for my personal experience, I must say this uh, green corridors, uh, what I've done so far, the, the, so far, the four streets, I mean, they're great if you walk around on them. I mean, I mean, you see so many people enjoying them. So hopefully this will also convince the current uh, leadership to continue with the work. But uh, we don't know. That's one of the problems. What we see in many cities is that you get these changes every four years. Uh, and uh, that might mess up a little bit with the long-term uh, policies. Uh, Hugo Santa, please. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation and I'm sorry for the background noise. Um, I, I, I have like maybe two related questions and that are also related to one of the last things that you said about equity. I was wondering if, when you were designing the the this uh, big project, um, you discussed or, or thought about how to include as well cities from from low and middle income countries, um, and like what happened. But I mean, I understand that this is a, a European funded project, but then I don't know if when you were designing it, you thought about how to maybe include some of those cities. And the second one is: Are you thinking about like maybe future? relationships with like other cities in in low and middle income countries maybe some case studies to include in yeah so i i think that's very interesting you know when we did, actually did the um, 
the um, designed the project. I mean, wrote the project. It was very much focused on Europe. I mean, that uh, because it's European funding, there was no need to go outside. But we know that the the, the bigger problems maybe like in lower middle income countries. I mean, and there are some good studies going on. I mean, that uh, uh, South America Salobal project has done some really good work. I mean, in Africa, there's a project called GDAR going on uh, where they're doing also some work. And we're very keen to work together with these projects as well. And actually in October, uh, we're gonna have a workshop here in Barcelona trying to bring together um, not only um, projects that that work in Europe on, on cities and health impact assessment, but also South America, uh, Africa, uh, and other places. I mean, uh, because it's important that we share the knowledge and experience that we have, and also how we can improve uh, the situation. Um, again, I mean, we're very keen um, if there are opportunities to work together with uh, cities and, and projects outside Europe uh, on this. So I welcome um, any collaboration. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Zorana. Yes, hi, Mark. Thanks for nice presentation. Uh, interesting project. I have a question about Copenhagen and green space, as you probably... <laughs> Since I you're think. based in Copenhagen, that <laughs> Yes, I'm based in Copenhagen. So it's a little bit counterintuitive finding, as you mentioned. So I'm wondering what could have explained it in your methodology. I mean, we proceed, we have many parks, we even have green cycling lanes. And um, so what could explain these results besides lack of blue space? And if it's so, do you tend to improve this and how in future? And I also want to mention that we have a very nice collaboration with City of Copenhagen on air pollution. We have a newly established air pollution expert group and Copenhagen has moved their air pollution area to health um, group um, so they would be interested for sure if we could participate more actively especially to understand green space finding and how to improve that yeah and blue space or will include blue space in the next phase of the project yeah mm. yeah so uh, for us it was a bit surprising for copenhagen now i must say it's been a few years ago since i've been to copenhagen that um, and i i know you're extending always an invitation to come and i say yes i'll come i'll come and uh, then i can observe what we find and i'm not sure if it's in copenhagen is that you know, there are cities that have quite a lot of green space and also have a lot of parks um, and also green space around the city, but it's not um, close to where people live. So you find that the city center and some parts are very dense with not much green space. Uh, and then the green space is slightly a bit too far away from their home because we looked at the WHO you know, recommendation of having green space within 300 meters. Uh, and I think that may may also explain in, in Copenhagen uh, why this actually is happening, that uh, it's there may be a lot of green, but not always where it should be in a way that. And then, of course, you know, there's quite a lot of water around Copenhagen. And so that is counted in our analysis as not green. We use NDVI as a kind of measure what is in there, and then it doesn't show up. So it, it doesn't show the benefits of green. Ideally, we would put also an indicator for blue space in there, but we don't have very good meta analysis or exposure response relationships for blue space yet. Um, blue space is a bit more underdeveloped area. Uh, and um, so we need to look at this a bit more. Normally, what you see is that, you know, a smaller population is exposed to blue space. It's not so easy to get exposure response functions. Uh, and that's why it's, it's not as, uh, as much as developed. So, but certainly we welcome collaboration. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, for us, Copenhagen is always an example city because of the, the cycling uh, as an example for many other cities. So we've been uh, using it before and we want to look at it more that as well. Just quick response that I don't think this pertains to Copenhagen. We have very nice parks in the city, very usable and, and used by citizens. But anyway, we could go in more detail and try to explain a little yeah, bit yeah. How, how green space was measured. And uh, uh, yeah, but we can catch up on that later. Thanks. Definitely that. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Now it's your time to ask. You may not always get an opportunity as well as this one.
Well, I must uh, say that. Oh, yeah, there's I'm, a question. Beatrice? Yeah, I have another question related with the health estimation. Is this something that you um, obtain um, based on epidemiologic um, data? Um, so when you look at the health estimation, you mean um, if we look at a thousand cities for the mortality data? So mm -hmm. as, as what you get is, um, you know, the mortality data comes from the urban audit uh, database uh, that uh, where you can obtain uh, crude mortality data for specific cities that are in the database. So that's what we used. And then we do the age and gender uh, specific estimates using nuts level to distribute population distribution. Um, and that's what we use kind of, you know, for the background or, or whatever you call it, uh, mortality level. And then within the health impact assessment, we try to estimate, you know, what fraction uh, of the mortality may be due to some of the exposures um, that uh, we're interested in. Now, when we go to um, the case city studies, um, we can do a bit more because uh, for the thousand cities, we don't have morbidity data on a per city. I mean, they're not available. But for the case city studies, we can go to the um, uh, city councils or other organizations and ask for morbidity data. So that's uh, in the case city studies, we don't only look at mortality, but also morbidity and include this. Uh, ideally for us, um, what we would like to have is also uh, city-specific morbidity data for all the thousand cities, but they're not available. So that's one of the big problems what we have. Another mm -hmm. limitation to point out what we don't have for the thousand cities is uh, area level social uh, social economic uh, data. Um, so as he has data, ideally we look at also the estimates of mortality in the thousand cities. Uh, by social economic status, uh, for example, on an on area or neighborhood level. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not available in the EU. What well, is a bit of a surprise to me uh, in this way. And we can do this within our case city studies, where we look at also the distribution you know, of the exposures and the mortality burden and the morbidity burden by social economic status. But um, this is not uh, possible within the thousand cities. One other thing perhaps I should point out what is uh, to me a surprise and what we don't have available is uh, transport mode share data for the thousand cities. As what I said, you know, many of our cities are quite uh, um, car dominated, uh, but actually when you look at a data set for all the cities in Europe, you can't find a data set that shows, you know, what percentage of trips are taken by car or by, public transport or by walking and cycling. And this is a big surprise to me. And hopefully also with this project, we can actually um, show that there are gaps of knowledge and uh, gaps of data uh, that should be filled in the future as well. Mm -hmm. Nice, interesting, thank you. Pleasure. Any further questions? If there are no uh, further questions, uh, please go to our website, uh, ubdpolicy.eu. Uh, you can get more information. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email me uh, or email to others, other participants in the project. Uh, I think it's a pretty exciting project. And particularly also, we would like to use the project to make an impact and therefore it's very important we work with other people that uh, I just would like to um, also uh, point out that tomorrow we're actually publishing a paper on um, the mortality burden related to um, different sources of air pollution within our thousand cities uh, it will be published in the lands of public health um, so hopefully that also gives us a bit more an idea, a refinement on our uh, air pollution uh, estimates and also um, an indication of what needs to be done in the future. As many of you know, may, at, uh, may know at the moment the uh, EU, within the EU, we're 
discussing the ambient air quality directive, uh, try to improve what we're having on, uh, at the moment. It's in the European Parliament, goes to the European Council. And hopefully some of this work actually will also help um, to raise the issues and uh, improve the uh, directive. So many thanks to all of you. Um, please feel free to contact me anytime and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.